look at the value chain. And a value chain is a linked group of business processes all the way from inputs to outputs. So from the moment a raw material comes in the back door, it gets unloaded, it gets warehoused, it gets sent to production, it gets shaped, molded, designed, packaged, shipped, sold, advertised, marketed, all of that adds value to the product. That's the value chain. You have all these different business processes. Each little dot is a process. Sometimes they branch out and another process follows on this one while the main process continues. So there's a lot of branching. It doesn't necessarily have to be linear. Multiple tasks can happen at the same time. We can think of an airplane design. You don't just design it all at one time linearly, but different parts are designed in different places. The value chain moves from research and development to design to manufacturing, uh, possibly warehousing, uh, to sales, to service, distribution, etc. I'm just giving you some, uh, some broad categories. And all these little things are business processes. And each one of those processes, guess what, has its own set of costs. So every process in the value chain has its own set of costs that, that have to be analyzed and managed. And they all have to be brought together to work together throughout the whole value chain. Now here is the major function of management. We think it's to achieve the strategy, but at, at the lower levels, the major function is continuous improvement in this value chain. Once you know how to get the product from its raw state to the finished good to the customer, then you look at that value chain and say, now how do we do it better? How do we do it faster? How do we cut costs out without cutting quality? How do we increase quality without increasing costs? How do we increase service? How do we continuously improve? That's where the management accountant has a lot of power in the organization. They look to him or her and say, what do you think? So there are different methods of achieving this continuous improvement. Lean production is a big one. This is what we call just-in-time inventory systems. Most large manufacturing companies are just-in-time. I'm not going to go into detail of what that is. But the main uh, emphasis behind it is to reduce inventory holding costs and inventory holding risks. And if you can in reduce your inventory costs, you, in you reduce your working capital needs, you can reduce your short-term financing costs. Hey, you're saving money all over the place, right? So if you're reducing your inventory holding costs and risks, hence the term lean production. You don't have bloated inventories. You're lean. Enterprise systems. There was a time when manufacturing would have its own uh, sort of uh, in IT system and marketing would have its own IT system, et cetera, et cetera. But they wouldn't talk to each other. You had all these separate little databases that never shared information. Well, an enterprise system, it works on the premise of if you have better data, you make better decisions. So with the advent of what is called relational databases, and the, you know, we're going back maybe 20 years, 25 years on the idea of a relational database. But instead of having multiple data banks, you have one relational database. And a relational database means every bit of information there is related somehow through some key uh, um, key identifiers. So a customer information may be in one place, but it may have a specific link linking it to a product that it has. One relational database rather than isolated data banks. When you call Apple service and you give them your name and number, they know immediately how many products you have. When you bought them, they know everything about you uh, and, and about your usage of the products. That is relational. They have a full picture of you. And how you lay in, they know when you bought in the store, when you bought online. Isn't that beautiful? And risk management. Yes, 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 yes. Management accountants are involved in risk management, but not hedging and using financial instruments. That's the CFO. When we talk about uh, risk management, we're looking at identifying and managing risk in certain areas. Intellectual property for one. There's a lot of stuff that's written down in an organization that if it got out, uh, it could be damaging, right? Let's think about uh, the recipe for Coca-Cola. McDonald's secret sauce. And the secret is it sucks, by the way. There's the secret. The secret's out. Intellectual property, data breaches. Oh, we're hearing about this all the time, right? Credit card information stolen. Well, you gotta, that, that hurts business. Poor quality uh, and then the potential litigation that follows. 
Look at all the uh, issues with the airbags and that big recall. Millions and millions of airbags that were uh, made poorly. Employee theft. And by the way, don't think this happens a little bit. This is huge. One study says up to 70% of employees will steal something. Supply disruptions. Uh, whether it be a strike at your supplier or a strike that you have, you have to manage that risk because a supply disruption costs money. And we'll end with a sort of a, a broad, more social topic, ethics, governance, responsibility. Ethics is a code covering certain things, a code covering in this field, competence, confidentiality, integrity, objectivity and I'm not going to go into detail about it because this is not a course on ethics it's a course on management accounting but it's worth mentioning here because if you are pursuing this profession if you are going after a designation you're going to have to get through an exam that has a whole bunch of this ethics stuff on there and it is set by the designation granting profession they have some, regu some regulatory approval to set their own code of conduct, a code of ethics. So understand this. It's the profession that, in, that, that, that has the code of conduct and ethics. So no matter where you work, if the organization you work in does not have a code of conduct or is ethical, you're still governed by the designating granting body that gave you your designation, you still must comply with their code of conduct. Cover CMAs regardless of where they work. Now, this is why regulatory bodies say, you know what, why don't we let the designating granting body uh, um, develop and, and enforce the code of conduct because it covers everybody everywhere. We don't have to worry about the company they work at. It covers the designation. So once you have the designation, you have to comply with that code of conduct. You may think, well, who's going to know? Well, listen, penalties for violation uh, include the loss of your designation. So you may have a job where your CMA is required. You lose your designation, you lose your job. Simple as that. And that has happened uh, uh, in, in quite a few instances where uh, with some unethical behavior, we, either through uh, lawyers or accountants, they lose their designation. That's it. You can't get it back. Once you're stripped of your designation, sure, you know the knowledge, but you can't work without the designation. You can never get it back. That's it for life. So, you know, be cool. Corporate governance. Corporate governance is your board of directors. They're there to ensure that management works in the best interest of stakeholders. But human nature being what it is, if I'm uh, on a board of directors of a large corporation, typically my pay for 15 or 20 hours of work a year is somewhere around 100,000 plus stock options. Do I really want to piss off the president? Or am I just going to agree with everything and turn a blind eye? I want that 100 grand, right? So, unfortunately, over the last 15 years, laws with legal penalties uh, have replaced what used to be moral and ethical guidelines. Our, our uh, elected officials are seeing that, look, this moral and ethical stuff, that's not really working. We can't, we can't count on humans to be moral and ethical, so let's put in laws to punish them. So now, when the top officers of a company sign the annual uh, uh, statements and the quarterly statements that are published, uh, they must sign them. They have liability, which means if they knowingly sign something that was wrong, they can go to jail. Before, that used to just be unethical. Now it's illegal. Corporate social responsibility. Again, this sounds nice, right? That a corporation decides that it's not just our employees and our customers and our suppliers that we need to worry about, but it's the broader community that we work within. We can't just go polluting whatever we want and using up resources without thinking about giving back, right? Well, here's the deal. It's a nice thought. Corporate social responsibility is a nice thought. But... And here's where the role of the management accountant comes in. You're probably wondering, why are we talking about social responsibility? This is not a course in, in sociology. It's, it's an accounting course. Well, here's the deal. So, social responsibility is typically embraced only if it can be shown to increase shareholder value. 
So if you're a management accountant in the profession and you want your organization to be more socially responsible, it's your job to show top management that acting that way can increase shareholder value. So now the management accountant's got a lot of power here, right? If they can show top management that being green or having some social uh, cause or social awareness raises shareholder value, off we go. Here's the problem. Here's the huge problem. Now that I've said that, extra costs to act environmentally positive, whatever environmentally positive is, any extra costs to act that way that cannot be passed on to the customer are usually not adopted. So it's nice to say to, to, to your organization, look, we really should uh, uh, act this way and act this way. It's better for our community and the environment. Top management says, well, what's in it for the shareholders? And you say, well, there's, there's no real anything. There's no real extra value that it adds. But, I mean, we just, we're just going to be really nice people. It's going to cost the organization a little bit more. Not going to happen. Any extra costs to be nice that cannot be passed on are not going to happen. So as a management accountant, you have to get used to the fact that management will do the right thing if the right thing increases shareholder value. If it doesn't, it will not do the right thing, even if the right thing is painfully obvious to anybody, tough. Therefore, a company will be as socially responsible and no more, it will be as socially responsible as its customers are willing to pay for. Your job is to show management that it saves money, it improves the process, it's more efficient, whatever the case is. If you want your, your, your top management to embrace something, you have to prove it with the numbers. <music> ¶¶